You guys look good this morning. Do you know why that's important to me? Because you can't see me? No? Well, here's the, here's the truth of the matter. I am so happy to be able to see you guys because we've had some power issues this morning. There, we got, now we got a lot. Now you guys can see me, right? <laughs> so we've had some power issues this morning, and actually we had no lights other than what you see behind me for the first service. And so I stood here and I saw nobody at the first service. So I am glad to see you guys this morning. So I'm just saying that to let you know that if we happen to have another hiccup with the lights, don't worry. We got it. We're all good, right? Because who needs lights anyway? Am I right? Yeah. So um, just wanted to kind of let you guys know that if we do have um, an issue, we are good because all these things are really nice and they're great. But if we don't have them and we're here together worshiping, that's all we need, right? Because the Bible says where two or three or more are gathered in my name, I am there with them, right? And that's what we're here for. And so just keep that in mind as we go today. We are kicking off a brand new series today called My Story. And you're going to hear some stories of people within our church. And then you're going to hear some stories of some Bible characters that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, or maybe you just don't know the story that well. And so uh, we're going to get that kicked off this morning. And so I'm excited for you to hear that this morning. Um, if you're here with us for the first time, maybe you're joining us online or joining us online for the first time, we're so glad that you guys are here. Um, we just appreciate you. And so we want you to know if this is your first time that we are about real love and real people. And so, you know, the real part is that, you know, sometimes the lights work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we get it right. And we're just to hear about loving God and loving people because Jesus told us in Mark chapter 12, that the greatest commandments are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. right? And so if we do nothing else this morning, if nothing else goes right, it doesn't matter because we are here to love God and to love each other. Am I right? Amen. So um, if you're here for the first time and um, we go through the service today and you want a little bit more information, um, you can pull out your phone and text the word CONNECT to 941-208-0078. Uh, if you're watching online, you can do the same thing. And if you've got questions, we'd love to answer them for you um, and just kind of help you if you're looking for information. Um, we appreciate you being here this morning. And I just want to say that I'm excited about the day. Even though things look a little bit different, there's some cool things going on. We have our discovery sessions kicking off this afternoon, uh, just a few minutes after this service. So I want to invite you to, uh, to come and hang out with us. I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we end the service. Um, but what I'm going to ask you to do right now is take a couple minutes, turn your attention to the screen, and check out some of the things that are coming up in the near future. It's that time of year again. We are looking for detail-oriented servants that love Jesus and love people to help with Operation Christmas Child shoebox distribution and collection on Sunday during our services at both campuses. Oh my goodness. Thank you. And thanks to the people who don't understand what a run-on sentence is. Goodness sakes. So anyhow, Operation Christmas Child. We're going to have shoeboxes available, but we need people to help with that whole ministry outreach. So, all you need to do is sign up by contacting Christina at K Dunson at wait, what happened to Brandy? Oh well. Contact Christina at K Dunson at dc3.tv and go ahead and say hey to Brandy too. She probably misses you by now. All right. Awesome. Due to an overwhelming demand for people in need of food, our local food pantry is struggling to keep food on the shelves. DC3 family, this is an amazing opportunity to come alongside our neighbors and help a local church that supplies food to over 1,000 people in our community. All non-perishable items are okay. Here are a few that are needed most. That's weird. Hmm. Please bring these items to all services at both campuses, Sunday, October 10th, and Sunday, October 17th. Any questions, contact Brandy at btown at dc3.tv. Our memory verse for the month of October is Psalm 139, 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. 
We encourage you to memorize this verse and to follow along with us on our weekly reading plan, available on the social media and the MyDC3 app. To get involved in, if you've got any questions on your way out, stop by the blue tent and ask somebody, and they'll steer you in the right direction. Um, so, are you guys ready to sing a little bit? Yeah? All right, so I'm going to ask you to stand up, love on somebody around you, and we're going to sing in just a minute.
Peter's last words are, you make all things beautiful in your time. Isn't that beautiful? That's that thought, that whole concept of, God, you're doing something in the middle of the darkness. You're doing something in the middle of the struggle. You're doing something, God. That's how he works, right? That's how he works. When we're going through the valley of the shadow of darkness, it's our shepherd that's leading us to the green pastures, right? Oh, man, we love the green pastures. Yeah. Well, I searched the world.
better than you. That, is it just lip service from us? Is it just lip service for me? Anybody been in a relationship where there's a lot of talk and there's really not much action? The words and the actions don't match and so you don't believe anymore what the person says. And so I'm just getting this check in my own heart. Am I just singing a song? Lord, there's nothing better than you, but my actions, my heart doesn't line up with that truth. And may it not be so of us, DC3 people, family, community, that when the Lord looks at us, he says, I don't know you. I, I hear that coming out of your mouth, but I don't know you. I don't know your heart. I don't recognize you. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Because your promises are true. You can't fail or lie, but we sure can. We humans sure can. And so we're gonna sing a song about the promises of God, and really that's what we've been singing all morning. That he is faithful, he is good, he's gonna see us through. But there's this caveat in this song that we're gonna sing. It says, I know your thoughts, your plans for me are good. I know you have a future and a hope. And that's from Jer Jeremiah 29, 11. It's a beautiful scripture and it feels really good. But it's sandwiched between verse 10, 13, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13. So you, if you just pull out 11, it sounds awesome and it is awesome and it's true. But we have to take it in context. And what has happened is the people of Israel, the children of Israel, God's chosen holy people, Man, he gave them everything, set them apart, has just anointed them and blessed them. And they got really proud and they thought it was all about them. And we're gonna, it, the theme for today is just so Holy Spirit led and driven. So I hope, I'm praying for ears to hear, ears to hear and eyes to see and, and hearts to understand. But obedience, is so important and so the Israelites did not obey and have you ever had a child not obey I got five of them so I've had plenty of experience and I am a child that has disobeyed so many times in fact the other day I was saying something to my kid and then I was like oh the Lord just reminded me of how many times I had done that to my own mom don't you love that oh gosh but that's where grace comes in so I can be gracious to my own child because hey here I am in need of grace but anyway had a child and you've made it very clear if you do this this and this you will have blessings and if you do this this and this you will have consequences or curses however you want to say it right and that's exactly what God did to his children he does it to us today and they chose to disobey and so they had just been led into 70 years of captivity not because God hated them or he was mean but he'd given them clear instructions and they chose to go another way and worship other gods and want to be around like the nations around them and so the Lord said okay you're being led into captivity but I still have good plans for you. I still have a future and a hope. Verse 12 says, if you will pray, if you will seek me, I will restore the fortunes and the things that I have given you and that have been stolen from you. So that's what we're, that's kind of where we're settling today on these promises of God. This is his word for us today. That yes, there are promises, but there's always an if then. So Lord, I pray for hearts that respond today, not just hear good words and these make me feel good, but we get in our hearts that you want more than lip service from us today. It's not about coming in here and saying the right things and looking the right part and then going out and living our lives however we want. You have a good plan for us, and it requires us to say, yes, Lord, I trust you. Yes, Lord, I understand that you are creator, that you are king, and you are Lord, and I have to submit my ways to you. I pray for fresh hearts to hear that today. My own heart, Lord. Where there's wickedness in me, where there's places that I don't want to humble myself, where there's places that I'm arrogant, I think, I got this. I don't need you. Get it out of me in Jesus' name. 
I had this picture the other day that we're just vomiting up all the crap and all the junk. Your body does that when there's stuff in there that needs to get out. So I'm just spiritually speaking today that we would get that junk out of us so we can be the people of God. We can be humble. We can led by, be led by the Holy Spirit. We can stand on his promises in faith because we have obeyed and we love our King. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. on Jesus. You are with me. What can separate us? You are for me. What can stand against us? Your love, it won't let go. I know it won't. Darkness, shadows have no power.
worship you, Father. We worship you, Father. There is no one like you. There is no one like you. Many have tried. Satan even tried. He was the worshiping angel and he wanted to be like God. But no one is like God. No one is like our King. No one is like our Lord and our Redeemer. He's always after restoration in our lives. He's always after redemption. He's always after us because he loves us. So Lord, I pray for a spirit of conviction, not a spirit of condemnation. I pray for a spirit of glory, not of shame. Lord, I pray for a spirit of understanding and not of confusion. I thank you, Lord, that you are here and you have come to make us alive, to not walk around as zombies, dead and asleep and unaware of what you are doing, but you have called us to life, to everlasting life. And our promises are yes and amen, but we may not see them on this side of heaven. So I pray that we would be like the people of old, the people in our past who are our great cloud of witnesses today. They're joining us. I just picture them joining us in worship today, or we're joining them actually. We're joining the angels today around the throne of grace and mercy. Lord, we thank you for your presence, this transaction that happens between heaven and earth, your kingdom and this earthly kingdom. Your kingdom has no end. Your kingdom is not shaken. So Lord, whatever is shaking in our lives today, we know there, even our bass player, Phil, his dad is in the hospital fighting for his life right now. God, I thank you that he is praising you in the middle of that. That's where the power is, my friends. When we don't feel it, when we don't see it, but we're standing on the promises that we know you're creator, we know you're good, we know you're kind, we know you're faithful, we know you're patient, we know you're loving, we know you're merciful and you're gracious. So Lord, we rest our hearts, we rest our minds, we rest our bodies even. I pray for a rest over our bodies today that we would soak in who you are and rest in the truth that you are working on our behalf if we pray, if we seek, if we obey. Because your good is always better than ours. In Jesus' name we pray. We love you, Lord. Would you say amen with me? That just means so be it. May everything that we've said and sung today, may it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Yeah, August 2014, uh, Robin and I were sitting in the pews at Grace Community Church in Goshen, Indiana, and my pastor got up and spoke about uh, ISIS and the invasion in Iraq. And my pastor stood up there and just wept and said, man, I'm gonna take a group of eight men to, uh, to Iraq. Hard-nosed, prideful, angry, uh, just full of myself. Uh, Marine, just uh, not a very good dad or a husband. Uh, you know, everything on the outside looked good, but on the inside it was just, it was a wreck. I just could not keep it together. Yeah, so when I was a young kid, uh, I remember going to church camp. And when I was at church camp, um, you know, I was doing what teenagers do, kind of acting a fool and, and uh, chasing girls and doing all the things that happen at church camp. And uh, I remember one day uh, a pastor came up to me. His name was Don Carpenter. And uh, Don looked at me and pulled me aside and said, Brian, I just want to let you know that, that God has a profound calling on your life. And I can, I can see it and I can feel it. And, uh, and I just want, want to let you know that one day he's going to do something amazing through you. And I was like, no, not me. Never. He can't do that through me. I was, uh, you know, drinking and doing all kinds of things that were against his word and uh, against how I know I should have been living. 
And so with one foot in, one foot out, I thought, no way, never happened. Fast forward, uh, ended up going to the Marine Corps and uh, uh, I met this blonde and uh, she was just gorgeous. And uh, you know, we, we ended up getting together and her name's Robin. For about six months, I would write her every day and then I came home and we got married and then we had to live together. And I'm not easy to live with. And uh, you know, she was in my space and it really created some, some riff. And you know, at that time in my life, it was all about me. It was all about what I could prove. It was all about you know, who I am, my image. Everything was about control. I knew that if I, if I stayed in control, I was safe. Um, it wasn't easy. I was angry. Uh, we had, Robin brought two kids into the marriage, two and one, Taylor and Bryce. And uh, I mean, I was not very kind. I was, I was still controlling, you know, they were in my space and it was always something that was just, uh, you know, drive me nuts. And it was at a drop of a hat that I would go sideways. And uh, I remember a friend of mine came up to me one day and he said, he said, Brian, if you aren't gonna go to church for you, you should really go to church because of your kids. And uh, man, it just stuck with me. And I remember one morning, Robin and I were laying in bed and we rolled over, came to the center, and we both said, same time, I think we should go to church today. And, uh, and we, we got into the building and uh, I saw the, the, the men in the ties and just the men that were just, just so, this perfect life. And I'm like, man, I can't be there. And uh, I remember a pastor at the time, his name's Tim, and he came up to me and he just started pouring into me. And he was a real man. Uh, he was authentic, he was caring, he was loving. And uh, I still don't know today if he really knows how much he impacted my life. But he, uh, and he just loved me and it was really good. And uh, in 2006, uh, you know, I was kind of still in that rut. I'm a, I'm a policeman at the time. And, uh, you know, my whole life was about control. You know, at work, if I'm not in control, then things are dangerous. So everything was still about control. And I remember going to uh, Bailey, Colorado. I got invited to go to a Mark Men weekend. And if I'm really realistic, the reason I was, I was going was because, man, I get to hang out with the guys. And we get to go to the mountains. And we get to go to the Coors factory afterwards. And it was kind of like the bonus plan. And I remember... My wife didn't really care if I got off the plane when I came home. She really was, we were at that point where she wasn't leaving, but man, there was just, there was nothing there. But that day, um, in May, 2006, Bailey, Colorado on the side of a mountain, God radically transformed my life. And I remember going into the, into the, the camp I mean, I hadn't cried in 18 years. And on that weekend, God just broke my heart. And uh, broke my heart for the way that I had treated my wife and kids, the way that I had treated people around me, that I was using everybody as a stepping stone for the next thing. I remember coming home after that weekend, and, uh, and Robin's like, man, what did they do to you? You know, what happened? And uh, we talked for four hours. It just, I was soft. I was pliable again. I was like that little boy when, you know, that little boy that just, you know, is, is connected and loved. I was back to that point in my life where I just felt like I could, I could love people again. That it wasn't about the next thing. That it was about, I mean, how, how do I impact uh, my wife? How do I impact the kids? How do I impact uh, people around me? And slowly but surely, you know, my relationship with him became just so much deeper and so much richer. You know, my heart prior to, uh, you know, marked men was hard. It was, it was full of all this stuff. It was full of, you know, my, what I had seen in the Marine Corps, what I had seen uh, in, the, in the police world. And, uh, you know, time after time, I would carry this stuff home. And I was so bound up and just so angry about things and it, and it would just come out sideways. When, when Jesus impacted my life, it, uh, it just made me um, focused. It made me um, connected. It made me loved. And uh, 
it gave me the ability to to just really love my wife in a spectacular way and in my heart was pliable and it was it was I was able to f function I was able to, to live into um, the calling that he had for my life and it was awesome Yeah, so we were going to Iraq to assist with uh, bringing refugees from Mosul to Rabil. And what we knew was that all the other missions organizations were leaving. And so we, we arrive in Iraq and we are, um, we're prayer walking around the city. And God opened door after door after door. I remember uh, we walked to this door and, and my, my friend says, man, I feel like we need to go in there. And we go in and it, we're greeted by a man that was a United Nations interpreter, spoke English, perfect English. And he said, Americans. And we said, yeah, he said, come on in. And it was all of the leaders from Mosul, all the Christian leaders that were in Mosul were in this one point. And we had a chance to sit down, develop a plan, figure out what they needed. And it was just a, a day where my faith was just so much deeper because I knew that God had listened and answered exactly what we wanted and, and and we found a purpose there and it was just it was so rich for me on that trip you know God really amped my faith up where I said you know I need to step out more you know if I can step into something like that I need to I need to step it up another notch and uh, so I was heavily involved with Fight Club up in Indiana and we had had, you know, we'd have 500 men that would come out. And the fire that came out of that group of men just changed my life. And, and 500 men chasing after Jesus and, and having fun and connecting and, and authentically loving each other. And I didn't have to be that guy in the pew. I didn't have to fit this mold. I could just be who I was. And so my vision is to continue that same thing in, in Southwest Florida and beyond. The goal is to bring men kingdom vision and come together, not from one church, but multiple churches to, to come together to serve Jesus together, but, but do it just in a radical way. To take men that may be uh, in the dumps, to may, maybe men that are, are older and they come down and they're, they're in this spiritual funk Maybe men that are lonely that need to connect. Um, maybe men that their sole purpose they believed was to retire, drink beer, and play golf. You know, it's to take those men together and, and forge a group of men that are going to radically chase after Jesus and just transform our community into something that's just Holy Spirit filled. That we have a transformation down here in the men and the revival occurs in South. Yeah, Jesus will radically change your life if you let him. And he, you don't need to be in control. You don't need to have it all together. You don't need to be that perfect guy. You just need to be you. My name is Brian Schroth, and my story is his story. Brian Schroth, the EC3, give him a big hand. I'm going to have to gather myself after watching that. I get to relax the last service, so I really get to take it in. Um, I just want you to meet Brian because there's so much more to that we had to cut out. I could have just done a 30-minute documentary on Brian's story. You know, you talked about one portion of that was when you got to Iraq, and you guys were actually moving refugees out of the country. Is that correct? Yeah, they were, they were uh, coming in from Mosul. We were meeting them on their route and basically getting them into the refugee camps that were in Erbil. Yeah, so you're a control guy. You're going in with this group that just got together from your church. What's the one thing your pastor challenged you and told you guys, the reality of this trip? Yeah, that... Um, that God was in control because we were going in, you know, we're going into a war zone and, and I don't have a gun. And so I'm out of my comfort zone, right? right? I'm used to carrying a gun in those situations. And so we got in and we just knew that God was in control and that he was going to do something spectacular if we listened to the direction that he was pushing us. Yeah. 
And pastor said, don't go if you're what? I forget. Well, I'll tell you what you told me. Pastor Jim said, if you're not willing to lay down your life, right? When you told that in the story, I'm like, I don't know if I would have raised my hand to go or not. Because it was a real situation, and you got there, and there was real gunfire going on. Uh, and we, we had to, but I'm going to let you tell that real quick, and I'm going to let you go. Yeah, so we were, uh, when we arrived in Iraq, uh, we, were, uh, we were near the Kurdistan airport up in Erbil, and we were kind of making movements across to, to make connections with uh, different um, corporate, or different, uh, uh, what do you call it, different missions groups and different churches and such. And I remember hearing the gunfire. And we had went to some areas where they, were, they had just finished uh, bombing these certain areas. And it was, uh, it was, it was definitely, um, there was a little bit of uh, heightened tension. Yeah. But, you know, the, the gift was, for us, was that, you know, we knew that God was in control. Right. And he did something spectacular. And what we didn't share was, you know, we, our church up north had done, they raised $250,000 on one Sunday and furnished 50 condos. And we moved refugees into those condos. And those condos that we had all these refugees in developed small groups and Bible studies right in the middle of a, a Muslim area. And it was profound because these, all they did was continue to multiply. And the church that we were working with went from 200 people to 500 to 700. And people's faith was just so deep. And it was because people stepped out across the board, just not us, but people across the board stepped out. It was really rich. So I have a lot, yeah, give God a big hand. That's amazing. Um, I, I, I call him Schroth because we have so many Brian's in the church, but Brian, when we met at Starbucks a few months back, well, a couple years ago, and you talked about this vision, you came from Indiana, came down here, and you're, you're, you're a law in law enforcement here, and you said, man, we have this thing in Indiana called Fight Club, and I want to tell you about it, and my heart lit up because I knew it was an answer to prayer. Charlie Hauser and I talked about it was a fulfillment of a vision that God had given us here, uh, and it's just been amazing to be a part of it. Uh, the, we are in our sixth chapter, is that correct? We're in our sixth chapter of Fight Club. Uh, how many men we have going through it this time? 95 men are going through, yeah, amen. So, but it just, just doesn't stop there, and it reaches many different churches in this, this area, which is really cool. But, Brian, recently you made a, a really bold decision to step out in faith. So in just a, just a couple minutes, tell us about what you're doing with Priority One and how we can help. Yeah, so we, um, my wife and I have been praying for something more, that we felt like God was saying there was something more for us to do. And so, um, about two and a half years ago, my wife and I were offered a position with a uh, not-for-profit called Priority One. And basically, they do, they, all they do is tell their, their, the men that work for them that uh, just to, sorry, there you go, there you go. <laughs> big boy voice. So, basically what they do is they take men that are already doing, um, doing ministry, they take them out of their vocation and move them into full-time ministry. And so we, off, we got offered that job two and a half years ago, decided then wasn't the time. Nine months ago, we decided that now's the time. So I'm going to be leaving the sheriff's office, and we're going to be walking away from a, from a second pension, and, um, you know, we're just stepping out in faith that uh, God's going to do something totally radical through this whole thing. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. DC3 has already committed to support him financially. We're not here to solicit funds from you unless you feel God has put something on your heart today through Brian's testimony, his story, to support him. If so, you, everything we get in missions giving this week is going to Brian's ministry. So if you go online and give, write a check to give today, and you write a missions part of that, that is directly going to Brian and a priority one to his support. So I am so excited about your investment in men. I just want to pray for him real quick, if we can do that. So if you would, uh, can you guys just stand with me real quick? I promise uh, we'll let you sit back down. I won't keep you up like Sarah might. To, no, I'm just kidding. It's all good, babe. <laughs> And if you want to lift a hand toward Brian right now, Father, I just thank you for my brother in Christ, God. I thank you, Lord, first of all, that you, you, you grabbed him. Lord, you, you snatched him away from Satan, from his desire to control 
from his frustration, from his anger, from many, uh, Lord, memories from his good service in the Marines and law enforcement that can, you know, stay with us and, and bring us hard times. And Lord, I thank you that he has turned his heart to you to reach men, to love them, to get in their face and challenge them. And so today I pray that his priority one ministry would be amazingly fruitful. Keep him through the hard times. May he see a, a, just a harvest uh, of souls for you. And we just thank you. We commit this to you in Jesus Christ's name. We pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, brother. All right, so if I can sum up Brian Troth's story in one sentence, because it's Steve Glover's story, it is God can take a control freak and turn them into a Jesus freak. Amen? And here's the deal today. How many control freaks do we have in the house? All right, those of you who are not raising your hand, raise your hand. Because here's the problem. As we get ready to go in our discovery sessions today, which are going to be really cool, and I'm going to be talking about Jesus, who he is, the problem with humanity is we are all control freaks. On some level, we are all there. It just manifests itself differently. But I want to challenge you with something today. We're going to look at King Saul for just a few minutes, a man's man, a, a, a Marine Corps type guy, a law enforcement. He was, he was the king, first king of Israel. Tall, handsome, had all the gifts, but he got into this situation where he started off as a godly, humble man, but he turned into a controlling, jealous, angry, self-centered man. And I'm like, that's me. That can be me. How does that work? And what I want you to see today is that King Saul's story can be any of our stories. Because here's what you need to see. The things that you're trying to control, whether it's your family, your money, your career, your health, the things, what if the things you're trying to control are actually controlling you? What if the things you're so strongly trying to control are actually controlling you? And that's what happened to King Saul. Now, for those of you who are not a church people, you don't know much about the Old Testament, Pastor Brian Sylvia is going to give us a great little backstory on King Saul. Watch this between the lines. Today, our speaker will be taking time to discuss some events from the life of King Saul. Now, first of all, it's important to distinguish King Saul from King Solomon. They're not the same person. And the King Saul in the Old Testament that we'll be discussing is not the same as Saul who became Paul in the New Testament. King Saul was essentially Israel's first king, following the period in their history that they were led by judges. Now, these leaders of the tribes led the nation during a period of what was continual corruption and turmoil. So the nation felt like they needed a king. They wanted a charismatic leader, a, a political celebrity of sorts to lead them. King Saul's story is told in 1 Samuel. Now, from all historical accounts, Saul seemed to have it all. He's described as a charming, tall, good-looking young man who exhibited strong leadership ability. Despite his potential to be a great leader, Saul was plagued by some personal insecurities and struggles. And we see an issue with jealousy toward a young, rising hero among the people by the name of David. Though David was a close friend of Saul's son, Jonathan, the king was overtaken by his jealous thoughts toward him. This overwhelming struggle with insecurity caused King Saul's leadership to be marred by lapses in his moral and spiritual life. Though he began his reign with great promise, his jealousy led to a deep-rooted bitterness and the ensuing bad decisions eventually caused the collapse of his reign. Saul reigned for 42 years. 
During that time, he and his son Jonathan had many military conquests. Unfortunately, the successful part of his time as king was mostly in the military realm. The Bible outlined his struggles with making godly decisions and his weakness in leading the nation of Israel in the ways of their God. In the end, Saul's kingship reminds us that leaders, in this case a political leader, are not to take the place of the supreme leader, that being God himself. Saul's legacy could have stretched beyond his military brilliance if only he had pointed the nation to the one true Lord. So let's lean into the message as we unpack some specifics regarding this first king of the nation of Israel. All right, guys, so I want you to go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 13, and we've been having some light. There they are. I wasn't sure if the lights were coming on. We didn't have any in the first service. So we'll have to see how it goes. So chapter 12, Saul is anointed king. The Spirit of God is on him. It's amazing. He doesn't even want the credit, but it's a cool thing. He is with it. He's a, he's a God man. He's a, he's a God freak. He's ready to go. But we see something happening in chapter 13. Now watch, watch the subtlety of the control issues here. In chapter 13, starting with verse 1, it says, Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gilbeah and Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistines, outpost at Geba and the Philistines heard about it then Saul now watch what Saul did then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said let the Hebrews hear everybody say let the Hebrews hear in other words everybody jump on your phones at that time they didn't have phones so they're like jump on your social media scroll right now right get your scroll out and we're gonna we're gonna trumpet this throughout the land He goes on to say, so all Israel heard the news. What's the news? God has given us a victory, right? No. What does the next verse say? It says, so all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines and the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. In other words, hey man, we are, we're taking all the Philistines. I, Saul, did this. Verse 5, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Everybody say, uh-oh. Saul them picked a fight, and we got trouble going on. He says, they went up and camped at Michmash east of Beth-Avon. And when the Israelites saw their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Turn to someone and say, they scared. Or scared, as we say in the South. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. They are running it. They are hightailing it out of there. They don't want to be any part of it. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. It goes on to say, he waited seven days. Now, this is crucial. In verse 8, we're going to see a circumstance and a situation. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. And again, if you don't know who Samuel is, he's the prophet of God, of just a man of God since he was a small child, Hannah's son, and he is the one who anointed Saul king over Israel. So Samuel had said, wait for me for seven days (coughs) to offer a sacrifice. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, now watch this, Saul's men are losing faith in who? And Saul, like, Saul, you picked this fight. 
Now we got this huge army coming up against us. What's up with that? So we see here that Saul is going, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Samuel's not here. And Saul, it says, so he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering just as he finished making the offering. Samuel arrived and went out to greet him. And here's where we come together. He says, what have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought. Everybody say, I thought. Here's where Saul got in trouble. I thought that the best thing to do would be, wait, didn't God tell you through Samuel to wait for Samuel to offer the sacrifice? How often when life gets hard, when circumstances are not peaceful, when our marriage is not going the right way we want it to go, when the kids, when our friends, when our job, when our career, when our emotions, and we go, well, I think the best thing to do is when we should be saying, God, what's the best thing? when we should be looking to his word, when we should be listening to his voice. And that's not to say you don't think, but it's all about where your heart is. Because out of the heart, everything flows from there. The things that we say, the things that we think. And here's where we see Saul getting into trouble. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. Well, that sounds good. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Now watch this harsh messes with me, two verses, verse 13 and 14. In fact, I want everybody to read it really loud with me. If you don't have your Bibles out, it's going to be on the screen. Say it with me. Here we go. You have done a foolish thing. I want to read that line one more time. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But we end with this. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. We are all in danger of doing a foolish thing. How many have ever done a foolish thing in your life? Raise your hand. All right, cool. We're all there. You know, I watched the progression of people, uh, especially children to teenagers. And then, uh, you know, uh, Proverbs describes three phases of life for people that don't know God. They're naive. They do things that are not good, and they, you know, they disobey their parents. They get in trouble. They pull the plate off. You know, they're mischievous, but they're still naive. Then you become, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old, and all of a sudden, those little... Night, those little mistakes you were making. Now you're a teenager, you go, Well, what if I do things I shouldn't do? What if I push the envelope? Anybody ever do anything foolish when you first started driving? That was a big one for my generation, right? We like to drive fast. We watched a lot of, you know, we, I grew up in the Smokey and the Bandit area. Anybody know that movie? Oh, dude, yeah, like just get in your Trans Am and drive 200 miles an hour down the road and outrun the cops, right? <laughs> Well, I didn't try that a lot, but every once in a while you push the speed, you know, you, you're trying to do your burnouts and those kind of things. When, in relationships, uh, when you, you know, you, you, kind of, I, I, you go, wow, God's blessing me so much that I don't need to just date one person. Maybe I'll try to date two. Right? That works out well, right? You know, I, man. You know what? It's really fun to get outside of mom and dad's boundaries every now and then. Anybody ever step out in that? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. 
And we do these foolish things. And here's the thing about foolish things. Proverbs tells us that you know they're going to get you in trouble. The fool is the person who knows the wheel is going to come off eventually. But, man, they just keep going. They're just like, yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. And what we see here is that Saul suddenly did something that he probably knew he shouldn't do. But because people were watching him and he needed to protect that reputation, he needed to control what he had that God had given him, he did something that looked godly, but it was ahead of God. And I want to give you this today. It's our, our main point, guys. Foolish things become fatal if we're not extremely careful with our heart. Now watch this, guys. So many marriages today, you get in the battle, right? You get sideways. It's frustrating. You've tried. It seems like everything good you try to create creates an argument and more division. And you go, well, she doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand me. But that person does. And so you have a conversation that you know is entering into a foolish zone. If you're, if you're honest, you give a look, you have a thought, right? Well, I thought this would make, bring some relief to that situation. Well, I thought, man, if I just bought that, even though I couldn't afford it, right? Man, I, I just, I needed some relief. I just thought, my mom and dad, you know, my grandparents, whatever, they're just too strict. They don't understand what life, I got to experience life. I need to know what it's like. To, and you make a foolish choice, and here's the problem. When it comes to your spiritual life, comes to your relationships if you don't extremely if you're not extremely careful about where your heart is that foolish thing that foolish thought can become fatal I remember back in uh, my youth pastor days you know in our American culture we're geared toward fun and there's nothing wrong with fun and pleasure we talked about that uh, uh, you know a while back but the problem is it can easily slip into foolishness and you can have fun to foolish, and then it can turn fatal. I remember back when my, uh, my kids first started learning to ski. We love to snow ski. It's a family thing we love to do together. And I remember Logan, who's not normally the risk taker, he was skiing really fast down a blue run. And I tell them, do not ski close to trees, right? If you are a skier, you know you don't go up in the trees and do that because that is where it's most dangerous and most head injuries happen and all that good stuff. But... Logan was skiing a little too close to the edge, and he went over this crossover, and the kids come back and tell me, Dad, you should have seen Logan. He went over the side right into the pine tree and, like, planted like a cartoon where it knocks the snow out. Now, the, the fortunate thing was it was a young tree that bent way over and came way back, threw him back. He had red face, and everything was messed up. And it was kind of funny, but he was, he was skiing, if you're a snow skier, out of control. He thought he was in control, but when he tried to make that turn or by that tree, poof, he got the tree. Now, that's kind of funny, but go back a few years when I'd been a youth pastor and took a trip, and I told this story a couple of times, where I had a couple of skiers, and I said, stay with your partner. Do not ski the trees. Stay in control. That's the skiing rule number one. And so the end of the trip, last day, last run, lifts are about to close. I see a sign when I come up the last run. It says, Steve Glover, report to the ski patrol. And I'm like, that is not good. That means probably one of my kids is hurt. So I get there. The worst thing you want to see as a youth pastor is I ski to the ski station as fast as I can. The ambulance is there with its lights on, ready to go. I'm like, oh, man, this is not good. I walk up, ski patrol stops me and says, we found this guy, is he in your group? His name is Jesse, yes. We found him unconscious in the slopes. They were lucky they found him. He hit a tree, he's got a bad head injury. I look inside, he's got a brace on, and 
they're like getting if you have a vehicle follow us so we're following uh the ambulance through the snow covered mountains i can't drive a church van you know and they're going fast the lights are on the sirens are going i don't know the extent of his injury and all of a sudden in the middle of this 20 minute drive to the hospital they turn the lights off and they slow the ambulance down so what did i think he's dead this is the kid that his dad was not a christian and said i do not want my kid going on that trip I begged him to let his, this kid go. And I'm thinking, how do I call this father? He's going he's gonna to kill me. I, I mean, I, I will never be able to live with this. Little did I know, and if you're a paramedic, I know we have some of there. I'm like, could you have not pulled over? We get there and said, I get out. I see Jesse's awake. He's, he's alive. Yes, he's alive. Yeah, man, we, he got stable. He's good. We didn't see any signs. And we believe he's got a concussion. He was throwing up. So we just slowed it down because we didn't think he was in danger. I'm like, you know, you put my life in danger, right? I was so. But the crazy thing is, guys, that story could have ended really bad, really bad. And the question I want to ask you today is in this world of vast knowledge, we know it all world of pleasure how many of us today are skiing down the slope of life and we think we're in control and we're skiing closer and closer to the trees in proverbs it says now and then my sons listen to me pay attention to what i say do not let your do not let your heart turn to her ways we're talking about the seduction of sin or straying to her paths many are the victims she has brought down her slain are a mighty throng her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. And I want to leave you with these thoughts. Guys, if you're skiing and you're out of control, if you're doing life, and the Lord is speaking to you today, here's what you need to do. You need to send out an SOS. Tell somebody right now, SOS, babe. If we go back to 1 Samuel 12, the chapter before, the Lord was speaking to Saul and to us today through Samuel. He said, if you fear the Lord, if you fear the Lord, Samuel 12, 14, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good, everybody say good, there it is, but... If you do not obey the Lord and if you rebel against his commands, in other words, if you start playing the fool, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. Now watch this last verse. Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Saul, serve the Lord, obey him, and you will see this great thing, but we see this end in tragedy. There are three things you need to do, and you need to take an evaluation on your life. The SOS, the first thing Samuel said, he said you need to serve God. Who are you serving today? That's it. I'm not going to stay there long. You're serving yourself, you're serving God. That's it. You're serving yourself, or you're serving God. What's the, well, how do I serve God? What's the main way I serve God? First of all, you give your life and say, God, whatever you want to do. You know what God wants you to do? You know how he says it in Matthew chapter 25 he said if you've done it to the least of these you've done it to me how many of us i'm um, the other day the guy is holding the homeless sign i'm i'm i passed him right by i'm like man you know why i passed him by i'm like he don't look like he's not eating i said it out loud logic reasoning control you're not getting you know now i don't know what did god say Am I serving my fellow man? Am I loving people? Am I giving my life? He said, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and close you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And the king will reply, truly, if you did this to people, you did it to me. SOS, serve. Secondly, guys, we obey. This is so huge. And let me tell you, Samuel called Saul out in 
chapter 15 kind of sealed the deal where Saul kept some cattle and, and livestock he shouldn't have kept. And he's like, well, I wanted to sacrifice these, and he disobeyed again. We see this heart slip. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? He says to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And I'm going to tell you what, you may think you're in control of your kingdom, but you're not. Your kingdom, if it's yours, is in control of you. Here's the deal. A lot of us Christians in America today, we're sacrificial Christians. Show me a need and I'll give to it financially. Show me a situation and I'll take time out of my schedule to do that. Uh, I'm in kind of trouble. I need to pray or when I'm feeling down, I'll go read the Bible. That's not, that's not obedient living. That's sacrificial living. You need to be sacrificial. But how many know serving God is a 24-7 lifestyle? If you want the inheritance, if you want to know what true peace and contentment are, you're going to give it all up. And here's, I remember being that guy sitting when I heard these messages going, no, 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 I ain't giving it up. you just trying to get me, you're trying to, listen, I'm going to tell you, if you're fighting this in your spirit right now, you have the spirit of Saul. I deal with it, man. God sent Jesus, his son, to die on the cross Jesus gave everything for you and in order to seal that relationship he wants everything from us everything that's the life you were meant for which leads us to the last one guys servanthood and obedience they are the bolt cutters of control they will control they will get that chain off of you. But it's hard work, man. SOS, serve, obey, and lastly, guys, you got to squash yourself. Everybody say squash yourself. you got to squash the rebellion of selfishness. Every one of us in here, our natural inclination is not to serve God, not to love Him. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and we're going to pray. What am I holding on to? without even realizing it today. I want, you to, I want you to close your eyes. Everybody, do go with me right now. If you're watching online, do the same. I want you to think about how much God loves you, Jesus Christ dying for you, and the freedom that he offers you, just as he gave Brian. So cool to sit in the filming with Brian and Robin the other night, and I hear these stories about they're not getting along, and I go, I'm just glad I don't know that side. Not that they're perfect, but watching the restoration of that beautiful marriage and relationships doesn't mean it's easy, but it means they know where their source of strength is now. They know who needs to control and direct and lead and guide their lives. What am I holding on to without even realizing it? Here's a question. What good thing is turning into an idol. Man, that's one, oh my gosh. Man, what thing do I do for God that's becoming an idol, man, that I beat people up about not doing, that turns into arrogance or thinking I'm better than somebody else when I'm nothing without Jesus? Where's my source of value, my real source of value? Where's my worth? What thing am I giving to God partially? Guys, is everything His? Is your career His? Is your bank account His? Is your worth His? Is your family God's? Your schedule? Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. God, I pray today that we, unlike Saul, would stop and repent and say, God, take my heart. 
guard my heart against selfishness and control, against this thinking that I know better somehow. Lord, let me learn what it means to rely on you and your spirit. Lord, let me learn to live in your promise again. And for those, Lord God, that don't know you today, I pray that they would begin to discover what they were meant to be, what they were created for. Not that they give up their passions and desires and pursuits, but God, they would commit them to you. They would give them to you. And you would use their talents, their skills, their gifts, their personality, their interests, their desires. Lord, you want to see your kids live an abundant life. So today, I pray that they would just pray this prayer, God, I give it all to you. I give it all to you. Your promises never fail. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, as Sandy comes, tell somebody, don't be a control freak, be a Jesus freak. Amen. That's awesome. Amen. Thank you guys for being here this morning. Thank you for those of you that uh, joined us online this morning. Um, a couple of things really quick. Um, just so thankful to have Brian here with us this morning. And um, as Steve shared, if you want to support his ministry, that would be an awesome thing. And so um, you, if you've got cash or check and you want to do that, you can uh, just simply write missions on it and drop it off in one of the boxes on the back wall in the auditorium or in the giving center. Or if you'd like to, um, you can give online. Uh, through our website, or you can text. You can do that now or when you go home. Uh, you can text the word GIVE to 941-208-0078 and just designate missions. And anything that comes in for missions this week will go to Brian and what he's doing. And so we're excited about being able to partner with him um, and just see what God does through him in, in men in our community. So thank you guys for that. Um, Next, I just want to say that I'm super excited that we are in about uh, 25 minutes going to kick off uh, our discovery sessions for the very first time. And Pastor Steve's been talking about that uh, in our Family Matters series. And you probably got texts and emails because it's so important. And, and what we want to do is we want to make sure that everybody is together on who we are as a church, as DC3, as the family, and, and to be sure about that connection and about our relationship with God. And so that's what we're going to do. And so I want to invite you uh, to stick around for that. That'll be about 1215. If you have kids, make sure you go and pick your kids up from the class. We will have child care, but we do need to have them checked out and picked up and then rechecked in for child care. And then also, we're going to ask you um, to just sign in. And we have uh, check-in attendants that are going to be at all of our stations and two people in here with iPads um, just so you can get checked in and get a name tag so everybody um, gets to know everybody because it's a whole lot easier to be family if you know who everybody's names, right? And so we just want to do that and want to connect. So I just want to invite you uh, to hang out with us for a little while this afternoon. We'll be about 45 or 50 minutes. We won't keep you here a long time, but it's some, it's some good stuff, some important stuff. So I want to thank you guys for that. So with that being said, again, thank you for being here. Um, if you're not going to stick around, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. If you have any questions about anything going on, stop by the blue tent on your way out. Um, again, God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week.